Good evening, I'm Zara Gunnar. Welcome to the studio this evening. And tonight we will be <laughs> doing more grass. <laughs> um, finishing off the grass and then once the grass is finished off we'll be giving the background some colour. Um, so here we go. I've just noticed this grass here looks a little bit Too smooth. Hmm. I also need to sort of come back around here somewhere with some more grass up here just because that kind of looks slightly wrong. So we've nearly finished this as to what we'll be doing after this. Don't really know at this moment in time. What I might want to try and uh, do is just finish off painting the seat and steering wheel and the dashboard for the uh, truck and then we can finish the truck off. Because that will just be sort of like final assembly. Now this is running a bit hot, let's turn that down a bit. Now we've got about a little bit of a shadowy shot of effect there so I'm not overly concerned. And so today, one of the things I've been doing today is debugging a bug, well sort of, trying to find uh, What's wrong with my analog to digital converter? Uh, for a little while now, they since the last Windows update really, when the PC resumes from sleep, they uh, it's been bug checking, uh, blue screening, and. It indicated that the microphone analog to the digital to analog to digital converter well, digital to analog converter the focus right device that I'm using is um, the the dump file indicates it is that that's causing a problem and indeed it sort of after a bug check it goes missing and I have to unplug it and plug it back in in order for it to uh, to be recognized and to work. So uh, I have uh, Focusrite help desk have been uh, making suggestions, which I've been looking at uh, today. You know things like making sure the driver was installed properly, and um, you know the, well, one or two other things going. And uh, they they even sent me a new version of the driver to try. But unfortunately, as soon as I plugged it in, well, not as soon as I plugged it in, but the first I re uninstalled the old driver, installed, rebooted, installed the new one, rebooted, plugged the the focus right into a completely different socket 
to what it was in before and started uh, started it up okay put the PC to sleep woke the PC up a couple of minutes later blue screen <laughs> same same fault so unfortunately then you the the driver that they sent me didn't achieve the objective which is unfortunate so they wanted a uh, the mini dump file which I've also sent them but I also have a full memory dump file so they hopefully well if they want it they can uh, we can have a full memory dump to look at and I hope they'll uh, find it because if not I've got to remember to either unplug the microphone sorry the converter before I restart my machine before I put my machine to sleep um, like after the broadcast for example or I've got to remember to do it before I wake the machine up Because it's virtually guaranteed now that it will uh, will crash. It kind of says um, the error kind of says oh, the interface didn't talk to me in time. It took too long to respond. A couple of minutes probably is a bit too long. But simply unplug it, plug it back in, and it works again. And the power on the ports is all set to not be managed, so it shouldn't be losing power or anything like that. Or maybe that's what I need to do. Maybe I need to turn the power management on. Now there's a thought to try. Because with power management on, the computer negotiates with the device. Uh, for reduced power. And maybe because it's not seeing that, but it's not communicating, is why it's... Um, having an issue. I don't know. I see what focus right say because I'm kind of a little bit concerned. Just a little bit. Because it's a bit of a pain in the neck having to remember to plug it in and plug it almost to the point where if I could afford it I'd probably buy a new interface. This is a series one interface, there's a series two. Um, as well as you know, similar things from other manufacturers like Behringer um, which may or may not do the same thing and that's kind of the frustrating part because I don't know whether they'll do the same thing but there again this moment in time I can't afford to buy one so I'm kind of stuck with what I've got or go back to wearing a, a headset and the microphone that's on uh, on there and I don't get to use this nice uh, Rode M3 mind you the other thing um, I will have to wonder about is whether or not there's actually a a Unix driver, I say a Linux driver for this uh, D2A because otherwise I'm not going to be able to use the M3 when I do when I stream the uh, the glass because I'm almost certainly going to need to use a PC running Linux just from the point of view of I don't really want to go out and buy Windows 10 if it will run under Linux I mean I know OBS will and hopefully most of the facilities I want also run on uh, Linux
Because if so, I've got to, I will have shortly a spare machine, which I hope will do the job. I kind of need to try it, I suppose. I don't know if you can. I don't know if OBS have a possible version for Linux, <laughs> um, or whether I can actually use a um, what is it called? A disk. Oh, I forgot. I've forgotten. I thought what, uh, I knew what it was a minute ago. Uh, the the disk that lets you just you know boot to the disk to a, a CD and run run Linux without needing to install it. been so all day today. If you see me blinking a lot, it's just my eyes so. Specifically my right one at the moment. Well, the, um, the glass studio is getting closer to completion. And I'm kind of hoping at some point next week I will be able to order a torch and a kiln and a whole lot of other things. Extractor fan, uh, glasses, um, glass, <laughs> uh, oxygen concentrator. desk legs because <laughs> that's the other thing I'm gonna need a need a desk in the studio so I was thinking um, the desk I'm working at now is quite nice uh, it's a standing desk can't afford one of those pity but I can't afford one of those it would be really nice just to be able to raise the torch up just by pushing a button here on the side of the desk but the, um, the legs are a little bit too pricey for that um, it's a night. What do you want? Just I don't know. Um, it's an IKEA desk that I've got here, which works really quite nicely. I have another one next to it, which is fixed. And uh, I was sort of thinking that if I get just the legs rather than legs and the top, then what I'd be able to do is get something like a worktop from a DIY store. And a fairly thick one, or well, maybe not. Um, but I actually have to have a look at the prices. But if I get a top, I can then sort of put a um, I was kind of looking at sort of using maybe concrete board or plasterboard, something like that, because it doesn't sort of well, as long as I don't get the paper covered one, um, it doesn't, bo uh, doesn't uh, burn. But I kind of like it to look at least halfway decent. So um, I'm kind of thinking that what I would do is get a worktop of some kind and then put something like a large ceramic tile on it or a few large ceramic tiles and because uh, they should be heat resistant from the point of view of A, the heat just coming off of the glass and torch but also if I sort of drop glass onto it or something then it's not going to start smoking shouldn't smoke it's not good for you um, and maybe even sort of put some of those on the floor but that's what I so I've got that to sort of um, source and then build but hopefully since I'm sure it's going to take a few days for 
a delivery of all the uh, glass stuff that um, I'll have time to build build the desk. Don't quite know how I'm going to store the glass yet. I'd use the typical thing, I guess, which would be uh, some plastic tubing, you know, stacked up in a honeycomb, I guess. But um, don't know where to put that. Just at the moment. Thing is, the glass can get quite heavy. You know, you. I mean, you. What is it? Sort of about three rods is 125 grams. So uh, a kilo would be about 24 rods, and so you know it soon adds up. And uh, with sort of a few different colours and things. So it's not uh, not something you know, to be taken lightly. And that wasn't meant to be a pun, uh, from the point of view of you know the weight is of a concern anyway. Okay, I'm making sure that, although I'm doing a fair number of sort of these things here, sort of, although I'm sort of, you know, spacing these out, I am trying to make sure that uh, I sort of fill in gaps and I don't have the, the lines so even that it kind of looks like you know regimented soldiers or something i need it to be quite random um and not sort of visible that they're all sort of stood in line so if i sort of just went like this it kind of you know you'd have spaces and it would look too regimented so i am sort of tipping the knife uh to one side and i'm doing it as i work rather than one at a time just like that and uh, going back over bits also need to make sure I go above where the last row that I did stopped because what I don't want is what will happen is that would become a line. In fact, it's starting to do that. I need to just break it up a little bit. And I, uh, one of the things I keep forgetting about, um, yeah, I want to do glass work, okay? One of the things I keep forgetting to look about, look up and sort out, is gas. <laughs> Can't do much melting without gas. Can't do much melting without oxygen either, but uh, that's a concentrator, so that's a bit easier.
Ah, the long night. Shot Eddie. <laughs> That's kind of funny. So, as I've mentioned before, whilst this kind of looks relatively boring to do, one of the things about it is, is it looks more realistic doing it like this than it would if I did it using just a solid colour. So it is time consuming to do and you know, it, after a while it gets to me as well. I mean I am concentrating on what I'm doing so I don't really notice the passage of time and I suddenly go oops oh I've done a lot more than I thought but uh, time continues to pass but even, uh, even after a while it gets to me if I've still got more to do I've not finished it yet so we are a lot closer. Now the wood has changed character here, so this bit goes darker a lot quicker. So just working a little bit faster, just um, so that it doesn't go as dark as it kind of wants to. Although it has done that a little bit across that interface, I can see it there. Let's see if I can disguise some of that. Essentially the disguise is just being careful to make sure that there's an even colour across the uh, across the grain. Sometimes that can be just a few sort of strategically placed darker marks than, uh, than in other places. And then uh, you ju your eye, it's just broken up, there's no line for your eye to follow. Now one of the reasons why I'm going upwards in doing this is 
partly because the knife blade lets me do it. But what ha what happens is that I do get, a, or potentially get a slight small blob here at the start when I touch down. The as I just did then. But then as I push this pen away from me, eventually it rides up so that the line tapers out and I get a fine tip rather than a blob at the end. Especially if I do it that way, coming downwards, of course, that's even more likely to create that blob because as soon as you put the pen down before you start moving it, that's when heat gets transferred a lot and causes the blob. Of course you can do all sorts of techniques, uh, maybe to some extent it doesn't matter a great deal, but uh, it keeps, you know, change techniques sometimes whilst you're working on something like this. can be useful as it just breaks it up, it gives you, you know, a different um, way of working, which sort of just, you know, makes doing lots and lots of hundreds of thousands of tiny lines. Yeah, a little bit sort of more palatable. I'm just cleaning the pen off. The tip was starting to build um, carbon. You know, I wonder if Stream Deck works on Linux. I shall have to have a look at their website and see if they've got Linux drivers. This is the hardwood again, that doesn't want to take a colour, so I'll just slow down. Sometimes it can actually be really quite pleasant to slow down just, you know, just to see the individual you know, lines of colour get laid down. On the end of the uh, from the blade of the knife okay I've got a transition there which I can now see so a transition between two grain patterns there's a knot hole or a knot here
closer and closer and closer and closer. I've got about another hour to finish uh, this bit off. Now this is where it does get a little bit awkward, I could do with a board underneath here or something just to hold this up here, but don't have one. I guess I could pile a few of these boards up, but that kind of strikes me as being a little bit unstable. some colour you would because I'm shading I can't just blast heat into the tool and onto the wood is it well perhaps this isn't a black and white image it's not even a monochrome image as such that wasn't the intent it is a monochrome in image but uh, what I don't want it to be is pure black and white it is meant to be shaded so whacking the heat up on the pen just to get it to uh, make some sort of mark here on the really hard wood just isn't going to happen My finger's getting hot. That is one slight downside for these thin pen, uh, light duty pens, as they call them. I don't quite know why. It seems to well, it seems to affect the light duty pens more than the heavy duty ones, or maybe just this tip is hotter. But I actually normally run one of my other shaders hotter than this, or at least with more current flowing through it. So I don't quite know. Never mind.
Closer, just this bit of grass left to do. And then we shift to a shader. May just mark, make some more slightly darker marks in there as well. You ink, go over there. Don't want you. You're not putting ink on this anymore. And Lady Zara has expressed a preference to have this and um, doesn't want the ink on it. So, as I guess it becomes technically a commission, then um, I will be doing what the commission E wants, as in no ink. A commissioner or a commissioner, and I don't mean the kind of the fella that opens the doors for you. Hmm. In some ways, I kind of hate doing the hard wood. <laughs> um, not so much on its own, but it, it, it's not so bad when it's on its own and everything's that, because then you just adjust your heat to compensate. But when it's sort of, some bits are hard, some bits are soft, uh, you'd be forever adjusting the um, the temperature. So like this bit's hard, but as I just come here, this starts to get soft. So even as I'm working just across a row of marks, then um, it starts, you know, you'd be forever um, adjusting it you know, from one part of the line to the next, turn it up, turn it down, and that can get really boring really quickly. Even if you don't consider this, um, Oh, so even if you do consider this boring. Okay, whilst I remember, there may or may not be a stream on Monday. Uh, just because of something that's going on in the day, it may well be the effects of what's going on in the day, will last into the evening. And if that's the case, then they, I won't be able to stream. But if that does happen, I will endeavour to tweet out and let everybody know.
closer we become and closer we get. Yes, I've got a bit of tea left. Shall I have some of that? Now I'm out of tea though. Now this foam, by the way, is part of the way in which you, the pen stays cool to, uh, to touch. Otherwise it is quite likely that the body underneath it would be too hot. But why the um, heavy duty pens don't feel the same way, I'm not sure. It's getting a little warm here in the studio. So we'll put a fan on. Now that will have a slight tendency to cool the tip down, but we'll deal with it. We can always just heat it up a bit. Especially if the fan's blowing across the work, I can generally feel a difference in the way the tip moves. Uh, that it's you know, it's cooler because of the fan. How do I know it's because of the fan? Because if I turn the fan off, it goes away. <laughs> kind of obvious, really, but not necessarily obvious.
just to touch more grass. And then we is going to be finished with the grass. Now at this point one thing I have to be a little bit careful of is rushing just to finish the little bit and uh, sort of you know, not taking the same level of care. It's very easy at this point in time to still ruin everything that I've done because you know I just well, gave up didn't take the care necessary
Yeah, that's the grass done. Yeah, then I was just going to adjust a little bit of this brickwork here. a bit darker than I wanted it to be but at least now in person at least there's a little bit more uh, visibility of the brickwork that's there what I need to do now is to put the top back on the pen is to switch the pen back to a shader specifically this shader and I'm going to be needing to be up around here, about 5 on the setting. And that should have warmed up by now. So now it's colour time. Yeah, that's not a bad temperature. So very slight colouring going on here. You can actually see it. It's pale, it's very pale. But that's essentially what I want for this. And as you might be able to see, I'm going over the grass and cleaning over the grass. That way, between all the little grass leaves, leaves up here on the uh, against this background, uh, they all get filled in with colour, as opposed to being a white line, which then looks odd. In this particular case, because the um, the hut is darker than this, I can just go over the edge of it without worrying. If it was lighter, then I'd be adding colour. I still am adding colour, but the colour change is, is slight because I'm not adding much colour. But I am adding colour, so if I'd gone over a bit that didn't have any colour on it, then it would have um, added colour to it and changed the town. In which case I'd have had to sort of go really carefully up to the edge. Although he says thinking, am I going about this the right way? No, I'm not. I'm going about it the wrong way literally so I want to go sidewards side to side ah uh, Katy Katia Lily Katia Lily oh yes <laughs> thank you very much for the follow that's very kind of you um I, the reason I want to go uh, left to right is because it's, it, I, I will I will be leaving um, small marks uh, and slightly unevenness in colour, but 
And if you were to think about, let's say, sunset, you tend to think of it as horizontal, you know, so colour, uh, either clouds or whatever, is sort of spreading out horizontally. It doesn't sort of give vertical lines. On water, you get vertical lines, sort of thing. But here, as a background, um, if there was any sort of colouring or something going on, you'd expect it to be horizontal. And I was going vertically, which is wrong. I should have gone horizontally. So I'm just going back over this a little bit because I can see some of those tooling marks. Just to even them out a little bit. Hide them before I carry on up here. Now, there's quite a bit of background to cover here. But there's no, no really easier way of doing it. There are, and I do have, larger shaders. One of the difficulties with a larger shader is, for, especially for light colours like this, so the shader I've got is sort of uh, square sort of shaped. Um, but one of the problems with larger shaders is getting them even or making sure they're evenly heated. Because if, if they're not, what you can end up with is kind of like a light and a dark line. <laughs> and you've got a, and then a light and a dark line. You've got to then sort of, um, you know, carefully align the pen to sort of try and uh, fill in the missing, you know, the, the, the areas which are too light. Or uh, in order to match the darker ones, you don't want bands. Uh, specifically, not unless you are literally trying for a sunset. And the the other thing is, you know, the, the larger the pen tends to run a bit hotter. It doesn't have to, but it, you tend to run it hotter just because it's a larger pen. And therefore, uh, it does you know colour the look the wood a lot more quickly. And therefore, and because it colours the wood a lot more quickly. If I want a really light colour like I do here, then I have to work a lot faster so that I don't transfer as much heat into the wood and I don't let it go darker. Now this is a really subtle colour, I guess, from the point of view of uh, those of you who are watching. Um, but what it's doing, you can just about see it, but what it is actually doing, this is, this colour here represents perfect bright white. And this isn't. <laughs> and what it, it, it just, it's a light enough colour just to knock that really bright in your face white that you've got here. And uh, just tone it down a bit so it's kind of like mist behind really, rather than sort of having the sun shining in your face. It's that sort of you know, difference. And it makes a heck of a difference uh, here because as I darken this, the moment a lot of these areas look really sort of high contrast, quite dark. As I just add some colour into the background, some of the edges, some of the bits around here will look, start to look a bit lighter. It will actually change the whole colour tone. And I may end up having to sort of go back over and go, you know what, I actually do want that bit darker uh, once I've put the background in. So there is often a sort of a, an iterative process of doing something, doing the things around it, and going back to the thing you you started with, and balancing out the colours. And as you move across a board, filling bits in. You know, I might have done some of these boards here, and then come back and done these, and then all of a sudden I need to redo those. And because I've redone those, I then need to do this bit again. And you know, because I have tweaked this, I might have. To, you, you end up sort of bouncing around a little bit. Um, and it seems like there's a shadow underneath here, which is just visible on camera. Needs to be a little touch darker, and that is because I added um, some colour just above it here, which altered the contrast, and so I've got to go back and adjust. But that's kind of, we, we are almost at final colours here, so this here really is sort of almost the final uh, final pass but this is this is a big one uh, to cover all of this board here now anybody who's not seen pyrography before pyrography 
is sort of defined as creating an image on a suitable material using heated tools and that's what this is it's a, it's a heated tool it's electrically heated I sometimes call it painting with heat um, you know wood burning is has been used uh, as a you know is often used to describe it but there is no burning involved there's no flames uh, the the heat I'm using is not hot enough to cause the wood to, to burn can't set it on light uh, and indeed the temperature of this isn't even hot enough to set um, paper alight I can apply pyrography to paper uh, what I'm doing really is more akin to cooking <laughs> or frying uh, I'm heating the wood that is uh, cooking some of the wood fibers and if you're at all familiar with maple syrup and how that's made then um, it's kind of the same thing when you extract the, the, the sap from the maple tree and you cook it you heat it up it goes this yellowy color and as you heat it more it goes darker brown until you get it real dark I don't know whether that's ruined it at that point no idea but um, you you know that's the the process of uh, cooking maple syrup changes the color and that's kind of what I'm doing here whether it's the sap or in the fibers of the wood or what I'm not quite sure but uh, there's no sort of naked flames being used now that's not to say you can't use naked flames you can actually you can use flame it's a heated tool after all uh, to apply pyrography it would you to do it on wood this size you'd have to use a real micro flame that's a really really tiny flame I'm not actually aware of anything that generates a flame that that small I'm sure there is some and uh, if I was after this going dark rather than just pale so I wanted a black background for example you can get gas powered soldering irons which uh, which burn butane fuel I think it is like you know, same fuel that is used in things like cigarette lighters but you can get soldering irons uh, which use a catalytic converter to um, convert the butane gas into heat which then heats the, the soldering iron tip but with a lot of these you can actually take the tip off and use the heat coming out of it to do things like shrink wrap things or in pyrography terms you can use it to heat the background here and it will because it's a very high heat it would actually um, change the color really quickly I couldn't make this pale color with it it would go really dark really quickly but it can be a nice easy way if you want a dark background something like that can be a nice easy way to get it because it can be quite smooth because it's a it's a flame there's no contact uh, or it's maybe just hot air in some cases is um, there's no contact with the wood then you're not actually sort of pressing down on it creating marks from the tool I mean I'm not pressing really hard but one of the things about applying a heated tool is the wood does tend to shrink and therefore you do get you know, some markings from it now something like the gas torch there's almost no pressure at all on the wood and so it sort of shrinks more evenly and so you can get a really nice smooth looking outline which can be do outline you know image which can be quite difficult to achieve with a tool like this even if I turn it up uh, the wood tends to texturize because at high heat the wood becomes kind of plastic soft like plasticy and you can push it out of the way but any sort of pressure on the tool does just push it out of the way so you create like a mottled background rather than a nice smooth one but there are artists that do use blow torches, acetylene torches, these sorts of things um, they tend to work outdoors <laughs> and they tend to work uh, on really large 
pieces of wood that are about you know, 12 feet wide, uh, 4 or 5 feet tall, these sorts of things. And uh, have a, a uh, fire extinguisher handy <laughs> because uh, they are, you know, in the, when you're using a live torch like that, then uh, you are in, I won't say in danger, that's the wrong word, but you know, it, the likelihood of actually setting the wood on fire is a high, is a high one. And so I suppose at that particular case, you really could call it wood burning. And that's just because a flame is at several, uh, you know, several hundred degrees or possibly several thousand degrees, which is enough to uh, uh, to cause wood to uh, to combust. Now if I wanted to work faster I could turn the heat up on this tool. I would then have to work faster to, to keep this uh, light colour because I, uh, the hotter tool means more heat is going into the wood in, a, in any given time space of time and the colour is dependent on the amount of heat in a particular space of time. The more heat uh, in that unit of time then the darker the wood becomes. So if I shorten the unit of time then uh, there's less heat. It doesn't go as dark. But it is harder to control that. And uh, if you need to, so, you know, if you suddenly find you've missed a little spot you want to go over it again with a high tool temperature that can often be quite difficult to do and to actually sort of get it in the right place just to hit the spot that you're after at least with uh, with a, this cooler tool that I'm using here because I can actually go over the same spot two or three times before the color gets unacceptable or starts to get unacceptably dark then um, I have the opportunity to sort of you know, get in this the smaller spaces and you know between you know, if I've missed a line out I can get in there without unduly affecting things around it but also because I am uh, doing this more slowly I've got more chance to make sure that I, I don't leave those gaps and indeed what the, the technique to use is this is is to half overlap what you've already just put down as you're doing these sorts of things that way then you don't leave gaps between the strokes as you go across the other thing of course I have uh, forgotten to do which I'll, I'll now start doing is not to start and stop <laughs> in exactly the same place for each stroke of the pen across so I had a line down there which I've now got to disguise, get rid of, just by you know, applying applying more colour around there. So as you're doing this, sort of make sure you don't stop and start in the same place, because you create the lines, uh, the banding. Um, it's the sort of thing you used to see a lot on printers, dot matrix printers, that create a band because one needle was firing heavier than another or something like that but um, you could see you could see where the print head had been so I've got to sort of just randomly start and stop so I get a really jagged edge and the jagged edge it's the straight edges that you see the jagged edges sort of just um, melt into each other and you you know it's a lot harder to see the edge as long as you stay away from sort of perfect lines where you stop and start in the same place then you know you can get a more even uh, smooth looking colour. What oh, are we at? Half past eight already. Okay. 
Now normally I don't like... I suppose I could do something about it. And I will do something about it. Let's do it right. Normally I don't like coming onto the edge of the board because it gets... you can't... you can't perfectly align the, the, uh, the tool to come on smoothly. So you tend to catch the edge which causes the tool to stop and therefore more heat gets put onto the wood just under the tool than if it was moving. So the edges tend to get dark because you know, you've applied more heat to them. And if you don't want that, either learn <laughs> to perfectly come off the wood onto the wood so you actually literally uh, meet the surface at exactly the right height um, which I'm sure is possible with lots of practice um, I'm not that good but otherwise turn it over and do what I've done you know start here and come off the wood again making sure I haven't got a straight edge but now I do have a colour along that edge and so I can now just carry on from there Now, as well as applying a colour, I am kind of ironing this wood. Whilst it was sanded to start with, and it was sanded with something like about um, 1500 grit wet and dry paper, or even 2000. This surface actually is really rather smooth anyway, but it is actually sort of somewhat surprising. When you've ironed it using one of these shaders, just how much more smoothly it gets. Now some of that is because you're actually sort of smoothing down the fight with the wood fibres that are sticking up especially after having been sanded. And um, the other thing is the cooking process. The, the colour that you've got here is kind of laid on the surface and it, it is sort of like a varnish. And like a varnish, you get a, you know, a smooth, shiny surface on it when it dries. That's assuming you're not using a matte varnish, which they do by sticking um, stuff in it to make it matte. Uh, but when you uh, when you apply a pyrography shader like this on the wood, you're getting a similar sort of effect as to having put varnish on it and it's uh, it's a lot smoother. I'd almost say glassy smooth but <laughs> um, it's not actually that smooth but it is you know between wood that's not been applied and applied you can feel an appreciable difference. But this, this colour is going on nice and smooth and one of the reasons for that is the fact that I did sand it beforehand. Always a good idea to sand your uh, hierography uh, before you start putting the colour on it. Because that way then you, you close up the surface pores, you remove some of the unevenness of the surface, you, know, you, you flatten it down basically, uh, you remove a lot of these little sort of hairs that are on the surface. Um, if you don't do that, the little hairs, for example, are so small that they they can't lose the heat, so they gain heat really quickly and go dark. Uh, and yet, you, you know, you can get a dark area and then rub your finger over it, and it suddenly goes a lot lighter because you've not taught button all those tiny hairs. But And the other thing we sort of like on you know if it, the surface isn't very uh, smooth, there's lots of undulations in it, or you know, maybe scratches that sort of thing, or micro scratches. Then again, the the pen heats mostly the the real top surface. So if you've got a ridge, you heat the the top, not the bottom quite so much. The bottom relies on heat being transferred down, and so uh, you can end up with 
marks which is the, the peaks which are darker than the, the troughs. If you've sanded it down there's sort of less difference between the peaks and troughs and they, they, they because it's closer the troughs are then closer to the uh, to the heat source they um, they get more heat and therefore more color so it becomes easier to have a smoother color so definitely worth sanding using really you know, fine fine sandpaper before you apply pyrography if you can And it does want to be sort of 800 grit or, or possibly higher. You don't want to be using sort of like 70 or 60 grit, that sort of thing. Uh, you basically, well, you'd sand your wood away if you did that completely, but that leaves a lot of big scratches in the wood. Does, does the the low low numbers of of um, abrasive? So like sandpaper is something you probably wouldn't want to use. Not unless it was sort of really high um, high numbers in terms of abrasive. As I say like 800 that sort of thing. And even then those can create uh, grooves in the wood. Which is one of the reasons why I do tend to use the wet and dry paper. Use dry. But uh, that, you know, that you can get really fine, like 1500, 2000 grit. And so you, you don't get scratches. I mean, technically, that's how it works by scratching the surface, but uh, there's such tiny, f fine scratches that they're just not visible. Now I could do something like a watery sun on this, so that would be sort of a, a circle, a little bit darker than this, not much, uh, not much darker, but I don't think I'm going to bother. And it would look, that would tend to make it look like a real sort of misty morning, possibly sort of like early winter. Now this wood has got actually some visible grain just here. I'm not going to be, not going to be too bothered about it. It will impact upon the colour. Um, I'll have to be careful there'll be a change of colour across the boundary. I've just got to make sure that change of colour isn't significant. As in, basically you don't see it. <laughs> Uh, and um, whilst I, you know, there was literally nothing I could do about these marks being here, um, sometimes with some sorts of background, this might be sort of like one. It can make, you know, maybe it looks like a bit of a cloud that's in there. It's a real pale difference. So, you know, it's a misty day with some cloud behind it. Then you might see that sort of thing, perhaps. Some of them though are a little bit too sharp for that, but
still making sure I'm going horizontal uh, resisting any sorts of temptations to go other angles now when you're first doing things like this especially the low heat I'm using here then you can get um, it can be difficult to see what you've done uh, whilst you're doing it afterwards it becomes more visible but it, what you can see fairly easily is the fact that I'm ironing the wood so before any colour comes out there's an, uh, a smooth wood you know the reflectivity of the wood changes and I can actually see the ironed wood so I know where I've been and then I can just go back over to get the colour that I want as opposed to going why isn't that the right colour well it's because I haven't got there yet Sometimes going in a, a particular direction, I'm going top to bottom just at the moment, uh, just partly for a change, but also because doing this top to bottom with this pen can actually be quicker. The reason being that the tip is probably, at this moment in time, the toe, the tip of the pen, is probably the hottest part of the pen but the back the the heel of the pen is also quite warm and if i do the usual thing of going half and half so uh, on any one stroke the next stroke half covers the one i've just done then the the heel of this tool is acting a bit like a preheater it's heating the wood uh, that I'm going to come on to next which makes it change colour faster because it's already got some heat instilled in it what are we up to? 22, okay may not quite finish this and I may just finish it off stream or I may carry on I don't know what I'm going to do we'll wait until we get to 9 o'clock which is roughly the time I'd normally finish uh, or we finish whichever comes sooner and we'll uh, decide then you know things like sunsets are kind of horizontal well one of the uh, one of the useful things about going horizontal is if I don't get to sort of uh, rows if you like the same color you know just like a sunset as you sort of go between the layers they're not all the same color so it has a sort of a similar similar look sometimes Now I'm not saying necessarily that I'm trying to do that. That would be, you know, it'd be nice to go, hey, yes, this is what I'm trying to do. You know, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm trying to get this smooth. But if it isn't, that's kind of one of the reasons why it is less of a concern to me than it might otherwise be. Uh, 
Now this particular piece of wood here is a little bit hard. And doesn't want to take colour quite so much. However, what it wants is really a little concern. Because what it will get is what I want to do. So I'm in control, not the wood. I'll make the wood do what I want it to do. And if it, you know, if it isn't going dark enough, I will make it go dark enough. It literally is just a factor of time. And I'm going off the top of the screen, aren't I? So let me bring that back into view. Now at this point, I can no longer see the uh, the ironing effect. It's there, but I can't see it. I'm just looking to see if I can see it. There, okay. I'm just tilting the board a little bit so I can see the nice smooth surface I'm making when I do this. So it's kind of like going over with a shiny paintbrush.
just checking whether I'm actually applying much colour because I'm doing it quite quickly. So I think I probably have to come back. So I'm going to uh, just carry on with the way I was wearing it for the moment. She's essentially sort of applying what is a really, really, really light colour, almost just ironing the uh, the wood. And then I'll come back and add in a little touch more colour. One of the key things with using, often with using a shader like this, is to make sure you keep it flat on the wood and don't sort of tilt it up because if you do, you don't get a smooth a colour. You'll actually sort of create dips in the wood and the colour intensity will be higher because it's a smaller surface area so the pen itself heats up. I sometimes use that when I just want to use the tip uh, of the tool and I'll uh, I'll purposely lift it up because then the heat that's in the rest of the tool it becomes like a reservoir of heat which then dumps out to the tip when I touch it down
Oops. I touched down before I started moving. Got a blob. That happens uh, as you lift the tool off the wood, it heats up because the wood is, you know, conducts heat away from the tool, uh, which means that it's it gets hotter than it is when it's in contact with the wood. So as soon as you touch the pen down, that heat then starts to be dumped into the wood. Now it can only transfer a particular particular rate, but it, it's fast. And so what can happen is if you suddenly just put a hot tool down on the wood, even if you don't, well, even if you start moving it immediately, it's been stood in that place, perhaps only for a, you know a couple of milliseconds, and yet that's enough to transfer quite a lot of heat, uh, and that's why you get the the blob. If you um, are moving when you touch down, then the pen basically isn't in the same place uh, well it's never in the same place it's always moving so it doesn't whilst it does transfer heat at the same rate that heat transfer is spread all the way across the area that you're working in and therefore it you know it's not hot enough to create that blob. And it's a technique that you can learn. It's a bit like a touch and go on an aircraft. It, it sort of lands but doesn't stop and then keeps going and takes off again. It's called a touch and go. All you're doing is do exactly the same thing with the pyrographic pen. You're moving. You land on the wood. You keep moving and then you lift off again at the end of where you want to get to. And if you do that you'll avoid, in a lot of cases, almost all cases, you'll avoid getting the blob. So what you need to practice is being able to land at exactly the point where you want it to land and to take off at exactly the point where you want it to take off. And if you practice that to the point where you, you, know, you can do it then you can fill in quite large areas without getting blobs. It also works when you're doing lines as well, or anything. Um, so quite a useful sort of technique to learn is the touch and go. Also very useful for airbrush painting or spray can painting. That's painting with spray cans, not painting spray cans. Nearly, nearly there. And again, not going to brush this. No point in going this far and ruining the last bit just by trying to rush. Now I'm not likely to ruin it enough to throw the whole thing away, but you know, practice not doing these things. Because if it was, for example, a portrait and the last thing I was doing was the eyes and I messed up the eyes because I was rushing, then I'd be throwing the whole portrait away. Here yeah, this is just the background, it's not as important as the eyes in a portrait. And I can sort of disguise some of the background if it becomes necessary. You can't disguise so the eyes in a portrait. Well you can, you can put a mask on them, but then that might defeat the purpose of the uh, the portrait in the first place. So I sort of practice being sort of measured, you know, not there's only a small bit left to finish dirt brushing. Take your time, enjoy the process. I mean that's what it art is about, that's what hobbies are about, enjoying them. If you don't enjoy it, shouldn't be doing it.
be nice if that applied to work as well, wouldn't it? Okay, so do I need a little bit of colouring over there? I don't need anything. Maybe about over here a little bit. And what I did want to do is to bring a little bit more colour just under there. And I can do that even with this cool pen. It is hot enough to change the colour. Which is what I've just done. There. So now it looks like you've got a shadow under there. Um, that needs a little bit just there. There we go. And of course you've got this slightly darker there and slightly darker down here so it sort of pushes the picture in a little bit largely unintentional but it just worked out nicely that this this edge is just crowding in slightly pushes your focus in towards the uh, the shed i think we'll call that finished it's five past nine oh, yes five past nine so it's nice timing well be nicer to finish just to you know five minutes earlier but it's nice timing so that's the shed done now exactly what I'll be doing on the next stream I don't know no idea there are a few things I could do including starting a new pyrography I don't know we shall wait and see that's an interesting thought um, but I'll keep that for the next stream now the next stream should normally be on Monday and I hope it will be on Monday but it might not be so just advance warning there is something going on during the day which could mean that i can't stream monday night but if i can i will be what i'll be doing i don't know time if well time the, the streams all start at the same time at the moment um monday wednesday and friday and that's at 7 p.m uk time that's at 1800 hours gmt I do try and tweet if I can't uh, make a stream, like if uh, on Monday, if I can't stream on Monday, I will try and tweet that out. So at Zaragonart, twitter.com slash Zaragonart. If you follow me there, you'll get the notifications. You can also, of course, follow me here on Twitch, but Twitch doesn't tell you that I'm not broadcasting. It just tells you that I am. If you'd like to see any of the earlier bits of doing this shed, then those that uh, YouTube, sorry, those that Twitch don't have available, and there's about three, I think, at the moment, are available on YouTube. YouTube.com slash Saraganart. And you can, uh, you can see any of them. Indeed, any of, just about any of the previous 800 broadcasts that I've done. Um, 600 broadcasts, 800 hours of video, something like that. They're all there. It's all in real time. All the broadcasts were recorded and they're made available there on Twitch, on Twitch, on YouTube. I do also have a, a website, zaragonart.com. That's work in progress. It tells you a little bit more about some of the crafts that are being uh, shown here on, on stream. Not all of them by any means. It's one of those long term projects to just keep adding to it and bring it up to. Day, you know things like pictures of this and what it is and why I did it that sort of thing there's also a, a shop on Etsy where there is some jewelry um, type things available uh, chain mail jewelry bead some beadwork um, for earrings necklaces uh, bracelets and uh, anklets guess what Zaragona etsy.com see the way around but still Zaraganart you can find me under Zaraganart just about um, in, in anywhere so I'm going to say thank you for watching hope I'll see you on the next stream bye for now <laughs>